welcome to the College Church. I am Pastor Heather. I am one of the two pastors here at the College Church. Our second pastor is currently in much needed vacation in Florida with his family. We welcome you to this morning and we have a special welcome for our my alma mater, Southern Adventist University Orchestra. And actually a fun fact, I played in this orchestra about 18 years ago for 30 seconds, I think. Well, it wasn't quite 30 seconds, but I came to uh, Southern from Montana and I think I, it was a moment of grand delusion when I auditioned for the orchestra. And I think it might have been a moment of sheer optimism for Mrs. Minner when she let me join. And uh, after the first concert, I stepped down politely because I realized that the talent pool to which I had fallen into was much larger and broader than I had anticipated. So now I live through vicariously through my kids, which there are several in here in this orchestra that will always be my kids, as I affectionately call them. And I am grateful that they are here and that you are here, and we appreciate you sharing that great talent with us. So thank you so much for being here. There's a few announcements I'd like to draw your attention to in your bulletin. Um, we have a kids' worship today. So the kids' worship is in the youth chapel. If you are a young person and you would like to be a part of kids' worship, please head on over there. We have the youth helping out with that. It's a great program designed specifically for kids, so you're welcome to join that. Afterwards, we have our potluck fellowship dinner, and whether or not you planned on coming, we would still like you to be there. Um, we're happy to have all of our guests come. I know lots of people have made great food. We have an... Uh, concert tonight at 4 p.m. with this lovely group of people here in the sanctuary. It's absolutely free. Invite your friends, invite the community. We would love to share in that with you. We have our regular um, weekly events that take place throughout the week. They're all in your week at a glance. Our grow groups have started. We're really excited about the grow groups this round, and we've been having a very successful first couple of weeks of that. So if you are in a grow group, if you missed your first grow group, don't feel bad. You can still come to the ones you've signed up to already. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is the holiday food drive right here. That's coming very quickly. It's hard to imagine that it's that time already, but it is. And in two weeks, we are going to be passing out our bags for the food collection here in the community. So please plan on being a part of that. Once again, welcome to the College Church. We are glad you're here. Well, good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. So we're, going, we're so happy to be here for you and to be able to sing for you guys. Um, we would love for you to join us as we sing these songs, and we're really happy to be here. Uh, also, uh, the lyrics are in your... In your program right here, uh, the hymn numbers that we're going to be singing are hymn 92, which is This Is My Father's World, and hymn 184, Jesus Paid It All.
We have praised in song, now we will praise in prayer. And I ask those of you who feel that you have some praises to make this morning, those of you who are having extra burdens this morning, I invite you to make your way down the aisles and in the aisles. Let us bow before our, na- our, our Savior as we seek His presence as we worship today. So if you have a burden, if you have a special thanks this morning, please come forward. All who are able, would you please kneel at this time? O loving Heavenly Father, our Redeemer and our friend, your children gather before you this morning, thankful that we have the opportunity to worship you once again. Father, we realize that as we do so, we come before you as sinful human beings, fallen creation. We realize that we are not acceptable to be in your presence. And we ask, Lord, that as you are with us this morning that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, forgive us of our sins, so that we can stand before you spotless. There are individuals in our midst who have burdens this morning, and they present them to you at this time. We have individuals who have extra praise to give you because you have been so good to us and we thank you. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit as we go through this day and throughout our lives because all around us, Lord, is chaos. We see discord locally We see discord and chaos nationally. We see violence everywhere we turn. We see the earth struggling, yawning, erupting. We see waters coming up, flooding. We smell smoke from fires that are killing Lord, we realize we have no control. And all these things are a result of the sin in this world. And we ask for your help, for your redemption. 
Lord, we pray for the families of those individuals who are affected by all the calamities around us. We pray for the people in Puerto Rico. We ask, Lord, that you give them comfort, give them water, give them food, and help us to know where we can help. We pray for the people in Texas and in Louisiana and in Florida and in Mississippi who are struggling from the ravages of their storms and natural disasters. From Mexico, where they are struggling from the results of the effects of the earthquakes. All around us, Lord, we see these calamities and we know they're a sign. And help us, Lord, to look for you when you come. But Lord, please help us to be ready. As we continue our worship this morning, we ask that you would accept our worship. Grant not only us a blessing, but all those who hear and see. We pray, Lord, especially for those individuals who have health concerns that are in our bulletin. We pray for the individuals who are in military service, wherever they are throughout the world, and those who are studying abroad. But most of all, Lord, we pray that you would save us in your kingdom when you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, my name is Lori Minner and I am the conductor of the orchestra that you see in front of you from Southern Adventist University. And I'm so thrilled to be able to be here with my group today. Thank you for letting us take part in this divine service and being a part of this community again. I taught here at South Lancaster Academy in Browning uh, in the 80s. I am a, a, an AUC grad. And Lyra and I were reflecting earlier today about being in this sanctuary on the day this church opened. I believe it was back in 1981. We sat over there where the youth ensemble used to set up and we watched people come out, the church family come out of Macklin Auditorium and walk across the street and enter this sanctuary. How many of you were there on that day? Do you, remember the, do you remember the event? I remember it so clearly. I also remember playing the Crown Imperial March 47 times <laughs> while people walked over from Macklin over to this. Dr. Rittenhouse just kept saying, go back, go back, we'll do it again. And it was, just, it was a very high day for me, at least, being, being a part of that, of that grand celebration, it really was, of occupying the sanctuary. So I'm so thrilled to be back here with my orchestra from Southern. I've been at Southern for 18 years now. That seems unbelievable to me. And uh, I'm, I, this group is just a joy for me to conduct and to travel with and to work with. And there are several New Englanders up here, so I was thrilled to get back uh, bring them back up to home. I'm, the reason I'm actually at the microphone, other than reminiscing, is to tell you that we're adding a piece to, to your bulletin. I'm, I've asked a Southern graduate, Stephen Blondo, if he would come and join us on this tour. And he's going to sing for us now uh, a movement from Mendelssohn's Elijah. It's entitled, Then Shall the Righteous Shine Forth.
I feel a little spoiled this morning. We're, we're spoiled normally around here with music, but I feel particularly spoiled um, having Southern here. And I just want to remind everybody, even though I am up here for the official offering call, that they are performing a concert this afternoon at four, which you've heard. What you may not know is that um, if you want to do something for the people of Puerto Rico, and specifically for our university down there, um, Southern toured Puerto Rico um, recently, um, last spring, March, and um, they would like to take up an offering to benefit um, the, the college down there um, to help with something very practical. And so I hope that you're gonna tell your uh, your friends, your neighbors, your family members, that they really need to come out at four o'clock, not only to just hear the beautiful things that these people put together for us, but also to benefit um, the college in Puerto Rico with something uh, of a generator <laughs> that is muchly needed there and that will um, make life a whole lot easier for the, for the people of Puerto Rico. So we have had um, an offering already, accidentally, but um, I'm thinking it's a good thing to take up another one. <laughs> um, but I will tell you what your offerings just did go to. Um, last year, some of you may remember that we had the pleasure of hosting a concert done by La Voz de, es de la Esperanza. That's the Spanish-speaking uh, portion of Voice of Prophecy. And... Um, Today's world budget will go towards the radio and TV broadcasts of the Voice of Prophecy and La Voz de la Esperanza that reach millions of people every year with the gospel. And they're being very innovative, so your offerings are not going towards um, just the television. They're also reaching out on media and things like that, and I won't bore you with all the details, but just know that that is happening. And also, as always, your loose offerings are going to our local church budget, which are definitely needed, so we ask you to um, have, hopefully you gave generously. Um, and although the offering has been already collected, we're going to sit back and enjoy an offertory done by Southern. And um, let's bow our heads to have a prayer for the blessing of the offerings that have been collected. Dear Heavenly Father, please take what we can and have given you and turn it into more. In your name, amen.
Our scripture reading for today will be Luke 4, verses 1 and 2. That's page 835 in your pew Bibles. That's 835 in your pew Bibles. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during these days. And when they were over, he was famished. Last year, Dr. Tamika Cross was traveling from Detroit to Minneapolis on Delta Airlines Flight 945. She noticed that a passenger a couple rows ahead of her had become unresponsive. 
his wife began calling out for help. After telling the passengers to remain in the seats, a flight attendant soon called out to see if there was a doctor on board. Naturally, Dr. Cross raised her hand. She was an OBGYN. The flight attendant looked at Dr. Cross and said, oh no, sweetie, put your hand down. We're looking for actual physicians or nurses or some medical type, personnel type. We don't have time to talk to you. Knowing that she looked young, Dr. Cross affirmed that she was in fact a doctor. The flight attendant continued to question her. She said, oh wow, you're an actual physician? Let me see your credentials. What type of doctor are you? Where do you work? Why were you in Detroit? Dr. Cross began answering these questions when a white male passenger came up to the flight attendant and said that he was a physician. According to Dr. Cross, the flight attendant turned to her and said, thank you for your help, but he can help us, and he has credentials. Yet, no credentials were ever shown. As a young black woman, this is not the first time that Dr. Cross has been dismissed or questioned about her abilities or the training because she didn't fit the image that people had in their heads of what a doctor should look like. And I would wager that this is the case for many people out there. They're expected to prove who they are and who they know themselves to be. Have you ever been in that situation? I know I have. And I'm sure for those of you like me who have been in that situation, you're gonna agree with me that it's belittling, it's embarrassing. If you've ever felt maligned for being true to yourself, you know that it is no fun at all. Jesus had very much the same experience as he embarked on his public ministry. Even though Satan knew that Jesus was who he said he was, who God said he was, Satan wanted to push Jesus into proving it. He wanted to put Jesus on the defensive. Let me set the stage for you. Jesus has just been baptized in the River Jordan by his cousin, John the Baptist. Maybe you know this part. At his baptism, the Lord spoke, and the Holy Spirit descended as a dove and came on Jesus. The voice from heaven said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus' calling had been publicly affirmed. Turn with me now to Luke chapter 4. I believe that was 835 in your hymn, in your pew, bulletin, or pew Bibles. Luke chapter 4. I'm going to start with verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Because there's no other people listed in this account, we can assume that Jesus shared this himself with his disciples. Our passage today starts off with the important part that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the same spirit that came upon him at his baptism. Jesus is not filled with doubt. He is not filled with pride. He's not filled with fear. He is willingly following the leading of the Holy Spirit into the desert for this period of temptations. Therefore, instead of being reactionary and playing defense, Jesus is on the offense. He is ready for this encounter. And you'll notice that he does not try to defend himself or God. He doesn't quote promises. The scriptures he referenced are commands from God found in the book of Deuteronomy regarding how to live in the promised land. This, along with the fact that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness, evokes images from the Old Testament. The period of 40 days takes on special significance in Scripture as it's often associated with hardship, affliction, punishment. 
but it is also a time of preparation, particularly when there's going to be significant involvements in the activities of God. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights during the flood. Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai. The Israelite spies were given 40 days to scout out Canaan. And Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days. These are just a few of the examples in the Bible. And then there's the wilderness itself. It's used as a place of preparation. Struggle and conflict lead to growth. It can lead to more intimate, trust-filled relationships. The Israelites prepared for their time in the promised land with their wilderness experience. And the wilderness that Jesus goes into is the same place that his cousin, John the Baptist, prepared for his ministry. Part of Jesus' wilderness preparation was being secure in his calling and his identity. Jesus was affirmed publicly as the Son of God in his baptism. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He is the Messiah. His calling was established by the highest authority, God in heaven. And yet, Satan is using that calling to belittle and diminish Jesus. Now, Satan has no doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. That's not what this if means. The intent of this if is to push Jesus to overexert his power and authority to prove that he has power and authority. Satan is pushing for Jesus to defend his identity, his calling, his mission. Basically, he's saying something like, well, if you really are so important, why don't you just force things to happen and make everyone fall in line? And you know, we do this to God too. If you really are God, why don't you stop the hurricanes? Why don't you stop the genocide? And if you don't do what I think you should, well, then, Lord, you really can't be all that powerful or that, all that caring, can you? Now, this was a continual theme in Jesus' ministry. In the very next section, the people who knew Jesus best, those from his hometown of Nazareth, mocked him. They refused to believe him. Church leaders throughout his ministry, looked down on him. And at the same time, they were threatened by him. Those who should have supported Jesus did everything in their power, including killing him, to discredit him. Those who are supposed to be our biggest allies are often the source of our biggest pain. It happens to us all. We doubt who we are. Maybe we see a super Christian who seems to have all their prayers answered, but we sit here praying again for the thousandth time just to get up out of bed in the morning. Maybe it's because of bad actions of other Christians, and we begin to doubt if we should distance ourselves. Should we shirk off the title of Christian? You hear people today calling themselves Christ followers. And there are always going to be those who are pushing you to back off, saying you're unworthy of whatever calling the Holy Spirit has put on your heart. It could be that your calling is seen as a challenge to them in some way. One of the first tactics of those who are threatened by you is to try to get you to doubt yourself so you will shirk away. A second is to try to get you to overstep in an attempt to prove your calling. And this is what Satan was doing. The first temptation is for Jesus to turn rocks into bread. It was a test to have Jesus check his humanity for his divinity. But Jesus didn't need to show off like the sorcerers of his day. His divinity was not about selfish power or gain. Man does not live by bread alone. And I'm sure most of you know what comes after that, right? But by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. It's from Deuteronomy 8.3. 
That's in the context of God providing manna in the wilderness. Notice Jesus didn't say that we don't need bread. In fact, later on, he would go on to teach his disciples to pray for daily bread. But what he is saying is that there is more to life than our physical needs. When we trust in God, we see that he takes care of all of our needs. Maybe not our wants, but our needs. Let's pick back up. Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 5. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this dominion, all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The second temptation in Luke's timeline is Satan's request to be worshipped. Now, if the order of events seems a little bit off, it may be because you're thinking of Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 4. The stories are basically the same, except the order of the last two temptations is flopped. The final temptation listed was the one the writer wanted you to pay attention to. For Matthew, a Jew writing to Jews, he connected the life, the events in Jesus' life, to mountaintops. As such, Matthew identifies this taking place on a high mountain. And it was what he wanted his readers to focus on. This temptation is itself a direct assault on Jesus' loyalty to the Father and his trust in the heavenly plan. But Jesus refused to consider the easy route to world domination by compromise with the devil. The ends do not justify the means. His loyalty to the heavenly mission is secure. And this is a temptation for all of us as well. Satan wants to drive a wedge between us and God. Luke 4, 5 tells us that the devil took Jesus up with the intention of having Jesus bow down to worship him. It leads us to infer that this must have been a high place. In the Old Testament, the phrase high places was used as a signal that worship was taking place as idolatry. Solomon set up high places for his wives to worship. And this was yet another high place picked out especially for the purpose of worshiping a false god. You and I have high places in our lives, those things that distract us from living to our godly purpose. It might even be your work and your personal ministry that is taking the place of your relationship with God. What high place might Satan be tempting you to today? The prize that the devil was offering was something that already belonged to Jesus. Even the Jews of his day knew that God was ultimately sovereign. The devil is a usurper who fights by the means of the hearts and societies of humanity. And as such, this temptation is really just an empty offer that would only give bragging rights to Satan. He could not give the true salvation that humanity needed. The best the devil could do is make Jesus the political, military sort of Messiah that the Jewish people thought they needed. Had Jesus accepted this offer, he would not have only failed in his mission to the Father, but he would have perpetrated the false understanding that the true purpose of the Messiah was to increase the kingdom of man and not the kingdom of God. For Jesus, to truly be the Messiah of prophecy, he needed to follow the path of humble service. His was not a messiahship of power and name recognition. Satan is trying to get Jesus to be self-reliant and sh shortcut his message, message and mission of salvation. But there can be no compromise. In his response to this temptation, Jesus shows us where his true loyalty lies. 
But in doing so, he takes it upon himself to change a little bit of scripture. The original quote is from Deuteronomy 6.13. And if you would, please turn there with me. Deuteronomy 6.13. Again, this is a message to the people before they enter the promised land. Moses is telling the people, you shall fear the Lord your God and you shall worship him and swear by his name. Did you catch the difference? Just as in English, both the Hebrew and Greek Septuagint, which Jesus read, use the word fear. But that word is not in either of the temptation accounts in Matthew or Luke. Jesus changes the word fear to worship and then uses serve in place of worship for the second half. He also adds the word only. It's not in either the Greek or the Hebrew, but sometimes our English versions supply it, but it's not there. For Jesus, he is saying that service equals worship. The implication here is that the Jewish people were to change how they related to God. They were to serve him as a sign of adoration, not just a cautious respect. A relationship with God is supposed to bring us reassurance. It is not a place of fear. I know that I am often tempted to confuse worship with respecting God, and it's quite common to speak about fearing the Lord. But we all know that God is love, and perfect love casts out fear. True worship of God is about a love for his presence, a desire to be with him. It's not about the fear of retribution or of hell. Furthermore, it is possible to respect God for his greatness and power without internalizing the gospel. It can be said that Satan and his angels have a level of fear and respect for God, but they do not love him. It is that lack of love that is their undoing. Now for the final temptation recorded by Luke. Luke 4, verse 9. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him until the opportune time. Why does Luke's timeline split from Matthew? For Luke, a doctor and a historian writing to a fellow Gentile audience, he wanted to draw attention to the city of Jerusalem. He marked Christ's ministry through the steps of Jerusalem. And now you see here, the devil can proof text with the best of them. He has little regard for the actual intent of the verses he's quoting. He's cherry picking verses. These ones come from Psalm 91 because these verses support the cause that he is trying to present. Jesus does not encourage this sleight of hand with the scriptures. He alludes to the full context of the scriptures that he quotes. He uses them in their fullest intent. Through his response, Jesus warns that true worship does not seek to dictate to God how he must fulfill his promises. And we need to be sure that we are not reading our own traditions and presuppositions into the Bible. We must look at the Bible as a whole to get a fuller understanding of the character of God and how we are supposed to represent that in our lives. Remember, there was a time in our not too distant past when the Bible was used to continue to dehumanize slaves in America, stripping them of their rights all in the name of good Christianity. In each one of his rebuttals, Jesus quoted sections of scripture in which the nation of Israel faced temptation and failed. At the outset of his mission, 
God's son faced the same tests, but he succeeds. The Israelites went through the waters of the Red Sea and were declared the sons of God. And then for 40 years, they whined about food. They were drawn into idolatry, and they often felt the need to test God because they could not believe that he wanted them to prosper. Jesus has gone through the waters of baptism where his status as the son of God is confirmed. And he goes for his 40-day wilderness journey of temptations, the final one being for him to refuse to trust God by, by filling his hungry belly in a misuse of power, a temptation to fall down and worship someone other than God, and to ask God to prove his concern and commitment to Christ. The temptations Jesus faced are plausible, attractive, and they make sense to us. Why not help yourself and make life easier than it has to be? God helps those who help themselves. But wait, that's from the 17th century English politician Algernon Sidney. That's not from the Bible. Jesus quoted and held firm to the commands of God, not the, province, the promises of deliverance. That's what the devil used to trip him up. And it was God's mandates for obedience that provided the strength of character and perseverance. How often do we quote the promises of deliverance when we should instead be quoting and embracing God's instructions on how to best live our lives and how to live in fellowship with him? True worship of God is about a love of his presence. It is a desire to be with him. It's not about a future reward or a future penalty. It's about your relationship here, your relationship now. And it's not simply knowledge of the scriptures that saved Christ and resulted in his victory. Jesus was filled with the Spirit. That's an example for us today. We are filled, when we are filled with pride and fear, we lash out. We put people down and we are undone by needless comparison. The Holy Spirit works to foster a sense of Christian community where we are all lifted up. We all have a place. We all have a purpose. Each one of us is to daily seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what grows God's church. Noted New Testament scholar N.T. Wright reminds us that the Christian discipline of fighting temptation is not about self-hatred or rejecting parts of our God-given humanity. It is about celebrating God's gift of full humanity. At the heart of our resistance to temptation is love and loyalty to the God who has already called us his beloved children in Christ, who holds out before us the calling to follow him in the path that leads to true glory. Our loyalty or obedience is not something that will force God to accept us or make Jesus come any faster. Sorry, we don't have that kind of power. We can't strong arm God. But being a Christian requires a choice that must be made of who to serve and how to serve. Christianity is choosing to be in an ever-growing relationship with someone who loves you more than life itself. Worship is the tangible demonstration that you have given over the rule of your life to God's will and not your own. Christianity is not about wanting to go to heaven and pet all the tigers, although I do want to do that. It's not about going to heaven because it's going to be better than hell. It's not about proving that you know all the right doctrines. It's not about looking down on others who sin differently than you do. It's about relationship and community. How does that gel with the image you have of yourself, of how others see you, of how God sees you? The next time someone asks you, who do you think you are? What's your answer going to be? Our hymn of dedication is number 148. Number 148. Oh, love, how deep, 
How broad? May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.